I have done a lot of public speaking in my career, but this is a lot more intimidating. Um, you know, I, I, my largest group I've ever spoken to was over 40 this morning, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, we're going to begin with a reading from Matthew chapter 25. We'll start in verse 31, Matthew 25 and verse 31. It said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When, when, when do we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you curse it into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also answer, saying, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then we'll answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. All right. You see on our screen we have five chairs, and these five chairs are for illustration purposes only. Because as we read, talking about the final judgment and how we treat the Lord and his people and do for him and serve him, I'm thinking we have five chairs that everybody in this room right now is sitting in one of these chairs. Each of these chairs represents a certain kind of person and how they're acting and behaving for the Lord. Um, so as we go through the lesson this morning, I want you to think about what each chair represents and determine for yourself if you're sitting in that chair. Because for illustration purposes today, the chair you're in will determine your eternal destiny. So let's get started with our chairs. Our first chair, I'm going to call the child's chair. This is a chair that represents babies and young people, young children, not competent of understanding the gospel. And there are several here that will sit in this chair. It's a simple chair, right? It's for those who aren't ready. And for me, personally, I think babies are safe. Not saved, but safe. Our second chair will be young people, young adults. And this is the chair for those who, by age and understanding, should have obeyed the gospel by now, but yet they've chosen not to for some reason or other. This is where they will sit. Our third chair is a cold child of God. And this is a chair for those who were once on fire, but for some reason have grown cold in their service to the Lord. Other things have taken more importance in their lives, and they sometimes have a little time left for God. So these are the cold chair people. This is where they sit because 
they think they're doing enough, but they do whatever else they want to all the other times except for serve the Lord. This is where they will sit. And our fifth chair is the on fire child of God. I can see on your faces you're thinking, hey, you skipped number four. I did for a reason. My family had the same reaction yesterday. We were going through the slides. They're like, Dad, you left out number four. Anyway, number five, this is the chair for the on fire child of God. This is the chair for the ones who are doing the work. This is the ones who want to do God's work. And I believe in general this is about 20 to 30 percent of the people. If you've ever been to school or you've ever been on a team project at work, you know there's some of the people do all the work and some take all the credit. And I think we have that same situation in the church today. There are some people doing all the work and some people taking all the credit. All right, number four. This is the chair for the lukewarm child of God. These are the people who were once on fire but have lost some or most of their zeal. Just a couple of weeks ago, Scott asked us, how real is your zeal? And I thought about that today with this because these lukewarm child children of God have lost their zeal and they're doing just enough to fill their service to God is just enough. So these are the lukewarm people. So think about what each of these chairs represent. We had five chairs, five types of people. So which chair do you want to be sitting in today? I hope it's the on fire child of God. Everybody will face death at some point in their life. We don't like to think about that. Um, especially when we're young, we don't think about death at all. But as you get older, it becomes a more real thing in your life. And let's say you have something happen in your life, some medical event, that you look at death and you consider death. But if you're doing what's right and you're sitting in the right chair, there's no fear of the death at, at the end. You don't have to be afraid of that. Have you ever heard, had someone tell you about their near-death experience? Or seen somebody talk about it on TV? Every story is practically the same. I died. I saw a light at the end of the tunnel. I went through that tunnel. I passed into the light. Well, then I came back. That's what they tell you. Um, I personally don't believe these people died and went anywhere. I mean, people die on the table, operations, have heart attacks, and we bring them back. But I have a hard time believing they left and came back and saw God in his glory and gave all that up. Um, Hebrews 9 and verse 27 tells us, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Judgment comes right after you die. There's no reason to come back. And in James chapter 2 and verse 26, he tells us, For the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. We all understand that we have an earthly house, that it's this body, and once our spirit leaves it, it's done. It's over. And we also can understand that we can physically sit in one of those chairs because it's for us today, it's representing where our spiritual body is sitting. And we need to determine where we're going before it's too late. Talking about earthly body, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, it says, We know... For we know that if the tent that is an earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, unclothed but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He has prepared for us this very thing. He who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. 
So we are always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. If we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body <clears throat> and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. You know, we all understand that this body is temporary and we should be longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Simply for the fact that we would get to be with God, spend eternity with him, but I believe a lot of times we um, don't really think about going to heaven. Like I said, we don't always think about death. We don't think about going to heaven either. We get so caught up in the day-to-day -day activities that we just don't consider what is to come. We don't think about it. We don't dwell on it. Let's read verse 10 again. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body whether good or evil. Just reading that one verse should wake us up and should reignite the zeal in us to do God's work. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 42, it says, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. We have a spiritual body, and it will be raised to meet God at the judgment seat of Christ. There is going to be two worlds after you, after you die. So what happens when somebody dies? The spirit leaves the body, right? We have a funeral. People gather. They say, ni say nice things about that person. Recount all these wonderful stories about that person. That's what happens. We've seen the body and spirit are separated. Um, but if you think about these chairs that we had at the beginning, I think we need to know where our spiritual body is sitting when we die. Because once death happens, life goes on for the spiritually, life goes on spiritually for the deceased. Life goes on physically for the ones left behind. We find in Luke chapter 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, right? Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19, if you take this as a literal account of something that happened, I kind of do. Um, I believe it tells us specifically that there is a place you will go when you die, either good for joy or for punishment. So in like Luke chapter 16, beginning verse 19, says, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, <clears throat> he lifted up his eyes, excuse me, and saw Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off. I've lost my place. And Lazarus at his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip his fingers in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in these flames. Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things, and now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so they may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. 
But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. There are two worlds after death. The first place is heaven. Heaven's a real place. It's a real place, and I hope you're looking forward to going there, because I am. It's as real as you're sitting here today. Let's look in Revelation chapter 21. He reads, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is where I want to be, in a place of no pain, no suffering, living in the glory of God and in his Son. Also, in verses 9 through 11 of that same opening, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues, spoke to me, saying, Come and I will show you the bride of the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a clear jasper, clear as crystal. Can you imagine being in the glory of God for eternity? What that's going to be like? Something I, I look forward to. In Revelation 14, 13 says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow them. Second world is hell. Hell is also going to be a very real place. It's going to be the place where the devil and his angels reside for eternity. It's described in Revelation 9 and verse 1 as a bottomless pit. And in Matthew 8, 12 is outer darkness. Have you ever been in a cave like uh, those caves you go to like in Kentucky and they take you in there and they turn out the lights? Once you're down in, the, down in there, you can't see anything. You can't see your hand in front of your face. You stand there waiting for your eyes to adjust to the darkness so that maybe, just maybe, you might see something. Based on what we read in these passages, I imagine hell's going to be just like that. He said it's a, a place of outer darkness. It's going to be dark. There's going to be fire and pain. Can you imagine how horrible that's going to be? Um, even the rich man said, I am tormented in this flame. In Mark 9 and 48 says, the fire is never quenched. It's going to be an eternal flame, eternal pain. Let's say we're sitting in the wrong chair this morning. We can change our chair. You can change your life and change the chair you're sitting in. Once you die, it's going to be too late. The Bible tells us there's a great gulf between paradise and torment, and nobody can pass over it. There's no second chances after death. Think about it. The day of judgment is for sentencing not second chances. Now, I've been to a lot of funerals in my life. A lot of funerals for Christians, great. 
We know where they are. We can praise God for that. I've been to funerals for people who aren't Christians, and it never fails. Somebody tries to preach this person into heaven. Talk about all the good things they did in their life, but they failed to acknowledge the fact the person never acknowledged God in Christ as their Savior. Um, we have to learn to appreciate what we have now, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ and God's holy word revealed by his Holy Spirit. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. All right, now, back to those chairs. We started out with our child's chair, right? We know that those people in the child's chair are safe. For uh, They don't have the ability to understand and comprehend what's required of them. Matthew 19, verses 13 through 14 says, Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. I believe little children will be in heaven. And we have our young adult chair. These are the folks we said that should have obeyed the gospel by now because of reason and understanding. And there's a lot of folks in this chair, but they don't believe that God will ever say to them, depart from me and turn into eternal fire. They don't believe that could happen to them. They tell themselves, I'm a good person. I do good things. But are you doing what God wants you to do? The people in this chair feel like there is always plenty of time. They think that God's love and mercy will save them. And he might. I'm, not, I'm just glad I'm not the judge. He may save them, but he also, I also know why to read in God's word. He tells us we have to do. I think I just died. Then we have the cold child of God. As we said at the beginning, these people have no fire, no zeal. They may have been baptized a long time ago, but they've just grown cold, and now they don't do any work for the Lord. Matthew 7 and 21 says, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We have our lukewarm child of God. <laughs> these people say, I'm not cold, but they're lukewarm. They say, I do some work. I do what I can when I can. I assemble most of the time. Revelation 3 and verse 14, it says, he wrote to the church of Laodicea, and the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I would that you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm, and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The Spirit said he would spit them out because they were lukewarm. Then we have our own fire child of God. These people are zealous for the Lord's work. They're always working. These are the people who are the ones to, that help make the church grow, themselves grow, and others grow. The Laodiceans were told to repent and be zealous we should repent and be zealous as well. Okay, as, as I wrap this up, let me ask you again, which chair do you find yourself sitting in this morning? One through five. I hope you've, I've given you some things to think about today. It's not too late to change your chair. It's not too, too late to change where you are spiritually with the Lord. Uh, so this morning, if you need to make a change, I invite you to come forward as we stand and sing, and we will assist you in that. The great physician now is here to sympathize in Jesus. He speaks the truth in heart to share, oh, hear the voice of Jesus. 
Sweet.